Hey everyone, my name is Vince Quiles reporting for the Real News Network. I'm the lead organizer from Store 4112 at Home Depot in Philadelphia. I'm also the interim president of Home Depot Workers United. Today, I have the privilege to speak with a very special guest, somebody who I consider part of the lifeblood of the labor movement. Some of you guys may know him as Mike Guy. I know him as a friend. Davida Uhatsafe from TWU Local 567, who's been on the front lines organizing for five years. Again, I very much look forward to this conversation. Without further ado, let's bring him in here. Let's out, Davida. How are you, bro? Just so blessed. I'm so thankful and I'm so honored to join you uh, as a guest on your show. And, uh, you know, let's talk about organizing. Yeah, let's do it, baby. I mean, hey, look, and, and just a personal anecdote. I remember when I was going through our organizing drive here in Philly and having a conversation with you. And man, that was that was a much needed shot in the arm, the way that you were just able to, again, just speak that energy through the phone and, and help somebody who, you know, is very new to this. I think you have a lot of interesting insight to offer others who are looking to organize. And hopefully at the end of this conversation, we can get a couple of them moving. Let's do it. Let's go. All righty. Well, so to dig into it, firstly, can we just get a little bit of backstory on you? So talk to us a little bit about your five years, you know, organizing and what area do you organize in? What is it that you do for a living? Okay. So uh, I, I, I've been a union member for seven and a half years. Uh, in the seven and a half years as a union member of my local TW, Local 567, um, I've been doing a lot of organizing, not within uh, the aviation industry where I work, I, I, I work for a major airline as a parts distributor. Um, and I, I'm very recent to my local. I was uh, Before that, I was working for fleet service in the same airline where we would load and unload luggage, um, uh, other commodities onto planes. But, um, you know, the way I got involved was um, pretty much not because somebody gave me the option to get involved. Um, I had to fight my way into, uh, into conversations of, uh, of being involved in the, in the movement. Um, my local, my former local, local 513 of TWU, we used to, uh, or I, I was a shop steward there for four years, but I was one of the, so we had this, this merger between two major airlines and then they, they had this hiring spree. Uh, and you know, the, the Dallas Fort Worth being a major hub to this airline, you know, I was, I was, you know, I came in with this whole big group of generate new generation of workers into the workforce. So, um, you know, you know, I spent the first couple of years uh, just as a rank and file member before I became a steward. Um, but that wasn't easy being, uh, you know, becoming a steward in my uh, in my local because uh, how young I was in in our move or in in the local. I mean, I didn't know the contract like, you know, those other senior stewards or those on the, the board or those who have been members for years. You know, I didn't have anybody to rely on to ask for questions like that, you know, because there are not many Tongan Americans uh, who are representatives in my local when I first joined. So um, it was tough for me to get involved because. I didn't know who to reach out to or how to even, you know, it, the first thing I did was to show up to the, the union meetings. And from there, uh, it kind of slowly, I started going to um, different, I guess, events that were going on within the local before they finally called me up and said, hey, you know, this guy probably um, is interested in, in getting involved. He's young. Um, you know, but, and they didn't know anything about me. There was no history or anything. So, you know, they get, they put me in the legislative kind of, uh, co uh, committee, if you will, it's, you know, the committee of political education. A lot of unions have it, maybe have a different name towards it, but the, the main thing is to, you know, get politically involved, you know, and, you know, hold, you know, people accountable if they're in, you know, office or to ask for support, you know, make endorsements, things of that sort. Um, but, you know, what was frustrating for me was I had to take a different route, whereas those who were also my age that maybe had a family member who was already in the union, they were automatically given, you know, spots as stewards we both didn't have anything to show for it. So how come this person gets to be in a position, but I'm over here having to do all the dirty work doing, and it's not, no disrespect, but 
I had to fight to be involved. Well, I was just I just wanted to ask. So, right, like something that I find interesting in what you're talking about is like, right, one of the things that we criticize when we look at corporate America, when we engage in these fights is that there's this claim of meritocracy, but that doesn't always quite seem to be the case. And it seems like even within the labor movement and in the local you were in, you still had to face that. You know, is that is that an accurate statement is to say, you know, there's a lot of nepotism, a lot of favoritism and not as much leaning on on the meritocracy aspect of it, right? Somebody, like you said, who's putting in the work, who's, you know, doing the dirty work, getting their hands dirty, and, and really, like, honestly, doing the most important parts of organizing, building those relationships, and to just kind of piggyback with that, you know, again, knowing you in the capacity that I do, I find you to be a very magnetic person. Um, I'm sure that your coworkers feel the same. Was there ever any consideration to get input from the workers around you to say, like, hey, like, no, like this is our guy, like this is the guy that we want when when stuff is hitting the fan to, to sit down and to, you know, really advocate for us. Um, so, yeah, so just to kind of condense that that question, you know, it seems as if, though, it's not as much of a meritocracy within within some of these unions as much as we would hope it to be. And how much input are they getting from the actual rank and file workers in terms of who they want for their representation? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the members will speak. And if they may not tell those who are in the positions of power within the local or international or whatever, but if they keep calling the same person like me to come and represent them or asking me questions, you know, they're, they're telling me they're trusting me without telling me they're trusting me. Because otherwise, they, they, there's other places they can get the information. There were stewards out there 35, 40 plus years. But yet here we are calling the guy who just showed up who just found out that the restroom was right there, and now we're asking him contract issues. Now you tell me who the workers trust more, you know, or who they trust. Um, you, you know, there is a an element of um, favoritism, you know, things like that, and, and that could be in any movement, you know. Maybe you have a family member or or maybe whatever within the movement that you have, a, they made a name for themselves and, and you're just another generation. I mean, you know, let's think of uh, President O'Brien from the Teamsters. He's a third generation union member. Of course, he's going to be involved in his name. You know, it, it, over there in Boston, it's it, it, he, they are known to be union people. But see, I'm coming from another country. My parents are immigrants. So when you come here, you have no name. You don't know anything about a movement. But you know that the people who work alongside, or, you know, work side by side with you, we may not work for the same company like the caterers, for instance, those who load and unload aircraft uh, catering uh, carts to serve the flying public when you're, you know, in the air. A lot of those jobs are uh, tailored towards, f uh, you know, first generation or immigrants, newly immigrants to the country because they're low wage, you know, low paid wage jobs. And those are jobs that, you know, they, they're they trying to fill the holes, you know, because they need to get, you know, they get, they gotta provide a service to the airline. Every airline needs caterers. But those are the shops that usually uh, people from my country will start off working. And they were exploited, you know, they were given, you know, they were taken advantage of because of the language barrier. And that happens to many of us, you know. Um, I would see that. We see me stepping back, and I'm in a good local here. You know, I'm I'm in an aviation union. This is hoorah, you know. But I can be standing within three feet of somebody who's doing another service for the airline, just like I am. Yet that the person's making one fourth of what I'm making, and we're both burning in the sun together. We're both doing the job that we're asked to, and and going above and beyond because of the elements, but yet here we are, and that person who could live in the same neighborhood with me makes one-fourth less than me. How is that fair where we can be doing the same job and, and our kids going to the same school? How, how could I sit back and, and allow these kind of things to happen when these are people who are in my community? So a lot of my organizing was actually not within my own local because I, w I didn't have any doors open. It was geared towards helping other workers. So I would have to freelance. To stay involved, I would have to freelance into another struggle. 
because I wasn't, the doors weren't open for me. And that's where really I learned about unionism and, and, and the, the strength that we have when we collectively fight together, regardless of what our jobs are. And, and we don't use, uh, you know, like I have this good contract. We don't sit in our silo and just enjoy the contract while somebody else is suffering. You know, that's kind of, that kind of thinking um, is kind of, it, it, it comes back to what I, who I am as a Tongan, my background. We are people from the islands who don't have much, but we hold on to the things, to our values, being together and helping people out. That's one of the biggest values that we carry on from the islands. And I'm just trying to inject that kind of feeling into the movement, you know, that I don't, I'm not here. I haven't been here forever. Just like you, we're not here. We haven't been here forever. We're trying to find that we're trying to find our way through this journey. But if we can do it, holding each other's hand together, we can figure this shit out together. Absolutely. So, you know, like at this point, you know, the state of the labor movement, there's going to be always going to be favorites and there's always going to be something that is going to keep somebody who's really hungry away from trying to help people. That's what we want to do, right? We want to help workers. But if we hold on to the relationships like you and I have and we build each other up, it doesn't matter whether we have a title as a president or, or an international president or any of that. None of it matters because the workers will follow those people who they believe will lead them or find the answers for them. I just, I just wanted to say, right, you, so you're, you're, you're kind of touching on something I think to be extremely important. And I kind of want to pull that thread a little bit more, right. In terms of the selflessness that comes with being an organizer, right. So you're, you're in a, in a local, you're already engaged in the fights that are within, you know, your own respective slice of a slice of the pie. Um, yet you're still taking the time to help and to fight for others. And, and I think it's just such an important question to ask people like yourself, like, like when you're when you're in the thick of it, when you're when you're going through these battles, right? And whether this is in the things that you face in your own personal work environment, or you're standing at a picket line for another group of people, like what are the things that you see just in today's working environment that like really like motivates you to speak with the fervor that you do, with the passion that you do, in order to try and get people to stand up? I mean, I know there are countless injustices that so many people could could really enumerate, but I think it's so important to hear from people on the front lines like yourself. You know, what is it that you're seeing in the day to day work life? What is it that you're hearing from the different workers that you're talking to that is such an animating factor to get you to fight with the ferocity that you do? I think the, uh, you know, the con the con making the connections between struggles, you know, because a lot of the struggles that I get myself involved in, I have no business in because I'm not personally struggling in that. But you find some way, you personalize it, you know, you meet somebody that works in that industry and you talk to them about, you know, you, you talk, we talk, you talk, we talk, and we talk about the issues. And I try to find a way outside of my own issues that, you know, work issues to personalize what it is that's happening with those folks and how I can connect it with me and how I can make it my issue too. You know, we need to start personalizing and that's why it's so important to get into somebody else's fight or to support somebody because you're never going to learn about the uh, the real issues if you're just taking somebody's word for it on a, 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 a like a picture or something if you're really talking to the workers they'll tell you they'll tell you what's going on and then you can go back to your workplace like I do and we can have conversations with those who think that maybe I'm I shouldn't be meddling in that workers issues you know because that's theirs you know we like to keep ourselves in silos when when we're you know because that's not our fight but it is absolutely our fight because it's our community who's involved those are the people who work alongside us they you know our their kids go to school with ours so our our communities are affected by it if that's not personally enough for you then you're in the, long, the wrong organizing movement because, you know, you have to personalize the fight. You have to find a reason to be agitated so you can agitate somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I feel you. I remember, you know, talking with a, with a UPS worker when I used to work at Home Depot all the time. 
And, you know, just always constantly trying to check in on him. Hey, dude, how you doing? Like, I remember he'd come in the summertime and he would, you know, lift up the, the back door of his truck and you'd feel like this hot air come in, right? And you'd feel genuine concern for that person because to your point, like we're, we're working together, right? This is somebody that has a family that, you know, is, is a contributing member to society. And ultimately there's this interconnectivity between everything that we do. And sometimes we may not always see it, but it's there, right? You know, you being a parts distributor, you doing what you do, I'm sure affected how we received the stuff that we received at Home Depot, right? I'm sure that there were probably things that we sold within that store that passed through your plane, right? And there's just this interconnectivity that's that's so important to consider, right? And I think it's why it's so important to hear your perspective on that is to remember that whether it's within your own personal work environment or, you know, somewhere else across the country, in the end, it all kind of bleeds together. And when you look at the way that our economy is set up, you know, the fact that it's so globalized, right? It's kind of forced to be interconnected. And in the end, you know, it's, it's not like the people at the top are going to care about us, right? It's, it's going to be the people like yourself who are showing up to these picket lines, who are trying to fight and inspire, you know, people, people along the way. And I think, again, that's just, that's such a major, major point to, to really reflect on. And, and thank you. Thank you for, for doing that, right? Again, that's something that makes a large impact. Um, something else I kind of wanted to circle back to um, that I think is kind of interesting to talk about, and you, you touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, but one thing I think is like really interesting too, like when you when you look at organizing, right? When you look at the values behind it, the concepts behind it, I think it's so fascinating to talk to people about what their inspirations are, right? In terms of what we just talked about, right? What you see in the front lines at work, the the issues that you deal with. But what is it also personally like for you, even apart from labor organizing, that helps to instill the values that are at the core of it, right? Things like courage, resilience, you know, engaging in a battle of attrition, staring down Goliath, you know, knowing you're David and saying, nah, we're still going to do this. You know, what what are some of the personal inspirations for you? I know you talked a little bit about your heritage. You know, if, if you want to delve into that more, we'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I spoke with uh, with with Max uh, a lot about my uh, about my you know my culture and how I connect my culture to the movement and my idea of solidarity is different because you know in the islands you know we're all everybody knows each other and you know everybody's family and if there's like a funeral or something any kind of event whether it's celebrating a birth or celebrating death. Um, everybody in the family gets together. You know, we get together. Not everybody has a lot, but if we put in together, you know, we 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 get the job done. And that's kind of what I brought here to the movement. I don't have a lot. People know very well that, that they've crowdfunded me to get two picket lines. But, you know, once the workers can get me there, I can talk about my culture and how my journey was helped by a bunch of workers who are listening in and say, you know what, let's keep this guy going because this is something that we want to see that the workers need to see that we do care about each other. And we're going to find a way to, you know, get their voices out or, or, or pass along a message that these workers are fighting. You know, this kind of organizing is, um, it's kind of like class struggle, if you will. Like I, I, you know, being, um, I guess, I don't know, I hate to toot my own horn, but I guess Go I got ahead, some out in this movement, right? And sometimes it is taken like a threat by those who are in high places. So when I show up to some, when I show up somewhere or if I'm having, a, like if I'm engaging with workers, you know, it's all automatically, oh, he's going to go and, and, you know, uh, he wants to go over there so he can go and, and, um, I guess whatever they think, what, what they don't, what, they're, what they're not taking out of it is I'm going out there to these different fights to go and amplify these fights, you mm -hmm. know, to work so I can go and talk to other workers about it. And I share it right. on social media. A lot of workers follow me, so mm -hmm. if I can make it, and 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 I use you know the the help that I get from the public, from other workers, as well as you know uh, at home, you know my wife, she uh, you know when she's we're expecting right now, but when she, we're oh, not congratulations, 
<laughs> when we're not expecting, she usually is like making earrings or anything, you know, that's uh, related to the South Pacific. Like she'll make uh, earrings with a uh, turtle shell, uh, you know, print or during the graduations, uh, high school or college, she makes lays. We would import flowers in and we would use the money she would make to fund me going to a picket line, you know, because although I have, uh, I can fly, you know, uh, I can non-rev if a seat is available, I can get on a flight free of charge, but I still have to pay for the, uh, the, the ride share or the public transportation to and from a picket line. Of course, if I'm stuck and I can't fly, uh, you know, I, I have to get a hotel or whatever, but it's those fundings that I get from regular workers who want to see me do this work that helps me continue to help amplify the message. You know, there's fights everywhere. And if I can make it to all of them, I, I, I would. But man, it's tough being, a you know, a rank file member and knowing that I, I can't just, you know, get off the manning, you know, because I'm doing union business. It don't work out. That doesn't work for me. I have to take days off. And that's a sacrifice that, you know, not a lot of people can understand because they haven't done it yet. You know, there are, there are people who, who think that this is, this comes easy, but it's not hard being a whole way away from home and spending Money on traveling when I can be buying something to put on the table, you know, I'm picking and choosing, you know, I'm 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 going I'm going with something but leaving some without, you know, just to all in the name of solidarity. And people tell me all the time like you're hurting yourself, but the way that I look at it, and the way that my family looks at it, my wife, my kids is, this is a collective sacrifice to show people that. You don't have a lot. You ha don't have to have money, or you don't have to be in a position of power, to to still support people. You know, you can you can show up with nothing. N you know, not a dollar to your name, but as long as you show it up, the people will remember. And I think that is invaluable to the struggles that we have every day as workers. If I can show them that I can struggle all the way to your picket line and then tell your story down the line, man. That's power. That is. That is. And I mean, right, that's that's the power within this worker movement. And of course, you know, that's something I think any any labor organizer would tell you, any anybody who's looking to get into this, you know, that is a battle that you'll have to have where you will have the best of intentions in your heart. But unfortunately, some people will still question that. But I think what's very powerful in what you talk about is remembering the mission, right? You know, in the end, an important thing, I think, for, for organizers to remember, this is something that, you know, even like I would still struggle with from time to time um, in, in my organizing efforts is, you know, like, don't worry about the people who are screaming from the bleachers, you know, worry about the work that's being done on the court. You know, in the end, if you're in the trenches, if you're doing what you need to do and you're doing it for the right reasons, that's something that's very important. And, and I can just hear and talking to you and, and you can definitely elaborate on this more, but it seems to be something that's very fulfilling because in the end, you're putting something out into the world you know, and, and not really expecting anything back, you know, and just hoping that if anything, what happens from that is that maybe others will stand up and fight in that way. Right. And that's the thing is it's, I think it's important to note the type of sacrifices in which you talk about, because that's how things like this build on itself and how they grow and they become stronger is it's because unfortunately for some of us, we're going to have to put a little bit more skin in the game, but you know, that's with the hope that the sweat equity that you put in will hopefully mean that somebody else may not have to put as much, right? It's the same concept with being a parent. You know, you go through the struggles you go through in the hopes that your child doesn't have to. And so as long as, again, we remember that mission, I think that's that's something that's super important, right? And that's a reason to be grateful for brave organizers like yourself and why it is that we want to encourage others to, to stand up and to do the same thing is because the more others can step in, the more it alleviates the burden on those who are already within the game. Um, and so with that, I guess just kind of like moving, moving towards the end of our conversation, you know, what would, what advice would you give to, to people who are looking to organize in their workplace primarily, right? A big, a big issue that people will face is the fear, right? The fear of being the one to step out and to have the courage to say something and the fact that they're going to end up being the black sheep in whatever work environment they're in, right? Some things that many organizers have to deal with, um, 
is is going in right and oh you want to protect lazy workers or oh you're just trying to catch a check like what advice would you have to give to people who are you know trying to avoid those labels but again just trying to find the courage to do what organizers like yourself do and help make their own you know part of part of the workplace a little bit better yeah you you know one of the i, I mean one of the most personal uh, pieces of advice I can give anybody who who, who is wants to organize their workplace is to uh, to know that you feel like you're alone, but also know that you're not alone. There is somebody you can call on, somebody who may not have organized in your workplace, but has organized somewhere else that may have gone through the same issues you've gone through. Reach out. And don't be afraid to reach out because you can't do this alone. There's just no way like it, organizing is about finding somebody to help you alleviate the pain of having to organize a whole campaign. You know this, Vince. You can't do it on your own. You have to find people and you have to hold on to those relationships and reach out every now and then. You know, those are the things that I think I am want to do as a I'm going to do better in 2023 as an organizer is to reach out to organizers like yourself, Vince, and those who I know who are fighting right now. And it's not necessarily to give you a pointer, but just to say, hey, you're not alone. You know, I just want to thank you for the fight you're putting in. I don't know all the details of it, but I know that you're making it better for somebody else because it, it could be a whole lot worse. Trust me. We know just by looking at the numbers, the quarterly earnings, that we are not, we're not the ones that they're trying to enrich in life. It's, we, in fact, every single time you see a quarterly and they talk about labor, there are people in the accounting who are figuring out a way to make your life harder by making you work harder in those eight hours you're working and cutting somebody else's job. So if that doesn't scare you enough as a young organizer to know that, you know what, we already got shafted with 401k, we don't have pension. But if they're taking all the, the jobs that we should be aging into when we're, you know, into our careers where, where we can, you know, I guess work longer to keep our insurance if you don't have it or whatever. But those those jobs where, you know, they're, those those jobs are being taken away and it's back to us. We have to fight for those jobs because if they start outsourcing or taking it away and giving it to, to whoever you're worse off, we're all worse off and we're forced to either work hurt for a long time or forced to quit and start another career. And it's like, you're starting all over again. So just, just know as an organizer, you are not alone. Please, please, please don't do this on your own because oh, yeah. there's going to be. And, and you know what? The, the organizing burnout is real. So every now and then just step back, you know, because when you come back, when you when we tag you back in, hey, you got to be ready. Yep, absolutely right. No, you're I think you're 1000 percent right on that. And that is something I think is so honestly beautiful to, to end on is the fact that, you know, this is a solidarity movement. Right. And, and you have people like yourself who are always there, who are always willing to try and share that energy. And so to anybody who's watching this, who's considering organizing, you know, remember that. Remember that always. Sometimes you may feel like, oh, it's the end of the world. Like you don't have any backup, you don't. But there are a lot of people out there who care. They may never know who you are, but they care. And that's something that's really powerful. And so I think if you have the wherewithal to recognize where you are and to recognize the opportunity to to organize it is incumbent on you to do so just as it's incumbent on us to make sure that we step up and support you davida thank you so much brother can you tell people where they can follow you keep up with what it is that you're doing absolutely yeah you can follow me on twitter uh my handle is my first name devita last name um uh, you can follow me on instagram at t Watafe. um and if you if you want to read a real badass article or slash interview podcast, the real news got one with me on it. You know, they'll throw it on the link. <laughs> there you go. 
there you have it. Again, like Tavita said, he's done a lot of great work and it's been covered here at the Real News Network. So if you get a chance, go back, check that out. I can tell you as a follower of Tavita, he's got some fire tweets. So you definitely, definitely want to give him a follow. And hey, if you're somebody who's feeling nervous, who's a little bit shaky or apprehensive, I can tell you I've experienced one of those Tavita talks. Reach out to him, you know, have a chat with him. So Tavita, again, thank you so much, brother. It was a very insightful conversation. Appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. And uh, I know I'll be talking to you again soon. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.